Well, I'd like to welcome to the show today, Jeremy Lenicky and Emily Frith. Emily and Jeremy, welcome. Thanks Thank you for having us on. Yeah, this, this has been kind of a journey to get you guys here. It's been a little bit of a back and forth. And, and one time, you know, I, I actually got sick with COVID and that, that delayed. Uh, so I apologize for that. But we're really excited to have you on and just talk more about your areas of expertise. Um, and so before I get into a little bit more of the details, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your stories. And uh, Emily, I'd like to start with you. Why don't you tell our listeners, for those of our listeners that know nothing about you, tell us a little bit about your background, how you went through academia, and your where you're currently at. So just you know, fill us in. Okay, um, so I guess I started, I got my bachelor's degree at a small school in Louisville, Kentucky called Bellarmine. Uh, there I ran cross country and track and I majored in exercise science. Um, then I decided that I'd like to pursue my master's also in exercise science. And I went to a small school in uh, Kentucky again called Eastern Kentucky University. Um, and then after that, I went to Ole Miss and I started out in kinesiology um, and worked with an excellent mentor, Dr. Paula Prinzi. Um, and initially, uh, I was in the exercise and memory lab and we studied the ways in which exercise impacts memory and a variety of different cognitive functions. And I became very interested in creativity. So creativity relies on memory because to create new things, you have to be able to remember what's already been done, right? Um, so that kind of became my niche area. Um, and so I studied exercise and creativity and that was my, what my dissertation was focused on. And so that was back in 2019. Um, when I graduated with my PhD in kinesiology, um, but I became very interested in the psychological theories behind creativity, and so I pursued additional training, um, again, still at the University of Mississippi, uh, but with Dr. Stephanie Miller in the cognitive psychology department and studied creativity um, and ended up getting a PhD in, um, in cognitive psychology as well, and then I went to uh, Penn State University and uh, I studied uh, the cognitive neuroscience of creativity because I didn't have the resources to study neuroscience at Ole Miss. And I was really, really interested in learning more about the brain because um, that was kind of one of the underpinnings in uh, Dr. LaPrinzi's lab, as well as Dr. Miller's lab. We were always talking about, you know, what, what are the underlying neural mechanisms that might have to do with not only exercise impacts, but also uh, creativity. And so um, I studied with Dr. Roger Beatty at uh, Penn State. And now uh, I work at a scientific consulting firm in Bellevue, Washington. And although I don't use uh, the concepts that I learned related to creativity all the time, I apply you know, my training knowledge and experience to a variety of different tasks that um, are really focused on human safety and performance, mainly, you know, in the workplace or, you know, buying products, interacting with products, like how do humans make errors and what can we do to help make sure that they're safe. Um, so we've done a lot of really cool projects in that area. Um, and I'm really enjoying the experience because I've, you know, I've had the academic experience and now I have kind of the, um, you know, the industry experience too, which I think is really valuable. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. We'll, we'll definitely unpack more on that creativity aspect, because um, not, not only myself, but a lot of the, the people that work within our group find that area fascinating. Um, and so, yeah, we're going gonna, we're gonna to unpack a little bit uh, more. Uh, but that's a nice pivot. So let's move over to Jeremy real quick. Jeremy, uh, tell us you know, your background as well and then what, what your current role is. Um, uh, and then, yeah, then we'll, we'll kind of we'll, we'll touch on the paper, but we'll, we'll let's just investigate Jeremy a little bit. Jeremy, tell us your story. Sure. So I did my undergrad in exercise science at Southeast Missouri State. Um, I focused on exercise science because I was a mediocre athlete uh, most of my life. Uh, I wrestled for a large portion of it, kind of got into bodybuilding and powerlifting. Uh, and my master's, which led me to get my master's in nutrition and exercise science. I went to um, Oklahoma, did my PhD in exercise phys. Yeah, I saw um, the mug. I was wondering what the connection was yeah, to there. Yeah, Boomer Spinner, baby, all the way. <laughs> hey, you know, we just won the, we just, side note, we just won the women back-to-back uh, -back national titles. So uh, Jocelyn Allo, uh, if she does listen to this show, she should send me a signed jersey. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so 
went to Oklahoma, um, did my PhD there, continued some of the blood flow restriction work, um, took a job at Ole Miss, and I just finished my eighth year here, so starting my ninth. Um, that's where, you know, at Ole Miss is where I met uh, Emily. Um, so, you know, the part that Emily left out is that she's, you know, I said I'm a mediocre athlete. She said she's actually an All-American um, in cross country. So I think the when you listen to her background as well, you can see why we needed her for this paper, uh, the one that, you know, is of interest for this discussion. So, you know, we do a lot of blood flow restriction, a lot of focus on muscle, uh, how to get bigger, how to get stronger, why do we get stronger? Um, you know, we're interested in uh, blood flow restriction and pain, blood flow restriction and discomfort, the methodology. But then, you know, we also kind of got a little bit interested in some of the cognitive uh, outcomes. Uh, but a as you know, when once you start to get a little bit outside of, you know, blood flow restriction and kind of your wheelhouse, it's like, well, we probably, um, we needed to get somebody who had some sort of background in that, someone who would tell us if, hey, you know, you, what you're saying, you really can't say. So that's where Emily kind of got on board with that project. Brilliant. I, I, I'm i so glad you brought up um, that you're both former athletes and, and I played college soccer as well. So I would say yeah, mediocre as well. Um, you know, I played at an NAIA school uh, and loved it for four years. Uh, you know, there, there were so many things that I learned as an athlete that I now can remember and can recall and uh, use, use my uh, athletic experience at least to sympathize with the patients that I'm currently working with. But I also have a little bit of a better understanding compared to maybe a clinician uh, who has never played that sport, right? So how has your um, former athletic background shaped your current, um, like your current direction of study? You know, like what you have gone through, how does that shape what you guys are currently studying? We'll start with Jeremy. Yeah, I would say that it, it gave me a lot of focus because mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I when I would go to class, I would try and no matter what the class was, I would try and figure out how it could I could use it to try and make me a little bit bigger and stronger. Um, and uh, although I look like this, I, I promise I did pay attention. Um, I but that's I think that's what it would do. I, I think I tried to um, just take everything that I was doing and see if I could apply it to my own kind of what I was trying to do at the time. Um, I also think that, um, I think you get this from having actual jobs as well, but I think you get it from sports is where, um, I don't know if, I don't, grit isn't necessarily the right word, but it, it's, it's something like that, which I, I think you get from doing sports for long periods of time, um, that I think is, is quite useful in life. So, and so I, I think it's, I think it's helped me a lot. Um, it, it's also helped me realize that. Not, not all of us are, are the same. <laughs> so um, I can train extremely hard. I can do a lot of things the right way. I can do all of this, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still, I'm, it might make me a little bit better than I would have been, but I mean, I could still be levels below someone else. So I think it gives me some perspective. Um, I think that it also helps me kind of understand, you know, in the exercise world, when I study research exercises that I have, some idea of, of what people actually do. Um, and um, I think that that can be useful. I think people forget that. I think sometimes when people hear me talk or some of the stuff that we do, they, they pretend like I've never lifted weights in my life. Uh, but I, I do think that having that experience has been useful. Brilliant, brilliant. Emily. Um. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things um, kind of like separate from what I study is just being able to operate well in a team environment. Um, so I, I love working independently. I don't mind working by myself, um, you know, but I've had great labs that I've been a part of. And now the, the team that I work with now is the best team I've ever been on outside of athletics. And my supervisor always says, you know, you need to lean on the team. You need to ask the team if you have, if you have things that you don't feel like you can do alone. And I'm not sure if I would have been as receptive to that if I hadn't been on sports teams before teams where you really do have to rely on the people around you to kind of elevate yourself. So that's one of the biggest things. Um, 
kind no, of like no, the, just... the rise, the, sorry to interrupt you, like the rising oh, tide, no, okay. you know, lifts all boats, right? Like the, the community, the group that you're around are, if they're constantly raising the standard, you, you, you almost want to keep up with that and, and you all improve as a response to that, but go on. I'm sorry. Oh, to interrupt oh yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're kind of the new kid on the block and you see the level of output and work and dedication that your teammates or your colleagues are putting into the job, then that motivates you to do the same and to kind of emulate what they're putting out. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's super key. Um, related to kind of what I'm interested in and studying and the kind of the tra trajectory of my career, um, I was always really, I guess, creative in a way. Like I like to paint, I like to draw, I like to write, things like that. But I was kind of curious, like, does, does athletics make people better at this stuff? Um, is there any way that, you know, I could leverage the, the workouts that I'm doing to make me better in the classroom? Or, you know, is there, there any type of, of kind of thread that connects at all? And, you know, sometimes there is, and it really is context dependent. I think that a lot, if you talk to scientists, they, their favorite thing to say is, well, it depends. And, and right. that's true here, too. Um, you know, but that that it depends is such an interesting question to me and one that I really like to unpack and that we got to do in this paper that we'll be talking about a little bit later as well. Yeah, that's that, that almost be, can become a default, right? Like, well, it just depends. It can almost you can be off the cuff with it and you can just say it to just about any question that, that's asked. Um, but I think if I were if I were to share my experience from from college soccer, it would be that similar to what Jeremy said and to what you said, Emily, about teamwork is that you can have a plan and the plan when if it involves other human beings it will it, it will not always go 100 percent according to plan and so i learned that i can be comfortable even during times of uncertainty um during sport and so then in times of business or in times of other relationships like with my wife and kids and certainly during times of work with a patient where things aren't going exactly to plan Right. So if someone has low back pain and they can't get under a bar and, you know, statistically speaking, they should. They're in the time frame. They're in the age group, the demographic. They have all the lifestyle factors that they should respond well. And they just aren't. I'm OK with that because I can recognize that the person in front of me is very unique and they don't have the same uh, the same response to the, the same stimulus that 100 other people before them have. Um, and I'm okay with that. And I hope that I can breed or breathe a little bit of confidence into the patient that it's okay. It's going to take time, but it's going to be okay. And I get that, that confidence during uncertainty from sport. Um, and so I just thought I'd share that with you, but go, going back, circling back to Jeremy real quick. Um, we first got, uh, uh, got, so I say we, cause we are a group of, you know, individuals that collectively put on education events for chiropractors and physical therapists and strength coaches as well. And we first came across your name, Jeremy, from some BFR papers um, and your work on cuff and cuff sizing, uh, which we, we thought was fascinating. So how did you get involved in BFR early on? Yeah, so I did my undergrad internship at the University of Illinois. Um, and around that time, right before I went, I started to get really kind of interested in maybe doing <clears throat> something related to science and sort of read a lot more of the literature. And I actually came across a paper that was kind of talking about blood flow restriction. Um, and when I read it, it said that, look, if you do this, you can increase muscle size, you get stronger. And I remember thinking like that, that just doesn't make any sense. So I honestly chalked it up to me just being an undergraduate and just not understanding what I was reading. Um, it didn't make sense to me that, that you could do that. Um, so I went to Illinois and when I was training up there at one of the gyms, uh, Lane Norton and a couple other people uh, who became my friends, uh, they were kind of talking about blood flow restriction and, and how might we be able to use this in kind of uh, a gym setting. And I was like, well, maybe I was reading that correctly. Uh, so I just started reading papers um, every day. Um, and I did my internship project on it. Um, and then when I came back for my master's at Southeast, my mentor at the time, Dr. Pugel, was like, I think you might be on to something with this blood flow restriction thing. You should, you should write a paper about it. And that, that was, I guess, 2008. So I said, okay, uh, sounds good. And I got in my car. I'm driving home. I'm like, write it. 
write a paper. I don't, I don't even know what that means, write a paper. Um, so it took me a long time to write the, the first one with his help. Uh, but then, you know, just kind of started putting things together. Um, but yeah, that's how I came across it. Um, and just kind of got lucky to study it, honestly, uh, to, at, towards the beginning. And there, I mean, there was other people studying it at the time. Um, and there's, there's a lot of people currently studying it. So, uh, but yeah, that's how I kind of got into it. It's just like most people, when they hear about it, just think that, uh, this is silly, probably dangerous and doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Cause it's been, it's been a few years since I've been in one of the, uh, the BFR courses. Um, uh, especially we, we are affiliated with, um, I should say maybe not affiliated. We're we work closely and we, we collaborate with Owens Recovery Sciences with, uh, you know, their BFR courses. And we're firm believers in the Delphi unit uh, as, as that being, you know, the gold standard. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on BFR devices? I know that, that might sound controversial, but they're not all created equal, correct? That's true. Uh, I, I wouldn't say there's a gold standard. Okay, um, I, I think the, um, the, the thing I, I think is good about the Delphi cuff is that you can apply the cuff and set a pressure relative to the cuff and to the person that you're applying it to. And it's very easy, it's all built in. So I think that is a, a really nice feature of that cuff. Um, I, I think that anything that you can use where you can try and detect the pressure, you know, we use for research, it probably wouldn't be all that useful for uh, actual practice, but we use the Hokanson device um, and just use a handheld Doppler probe. So basically we apply I cuff to whatever limb we're going to and just take a pull. So we just take the lowest pressure, which that pulse disappears. So that's doing kind of what the Delphi is doing. Uh, but you have to have a separate piece of equipment. So again, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement that the Delphi is a, an excellent cuff. Um, but I, I think as long as you can apply um, a relative pressure, I think that that's, especially in a clinical setting, I think that that's what the best part of it is. I think you know, one of my other interests is practical restriction where you just, you know, my first paper was on applying elastic knee wraps. You know, I, I was into powerlifting. So, you know, we took knee wraps that you use for powerlifting. We just, we use that to restrict blood flow. Um, and early on, people would look at you like you're, maybe you have experience with drugs, uh, which I did not have. Um, but I, I think that that can be okay if you're kind of overtly healthy and you have some idea of what you're doing in a normal gym setting. I, I wouldn't do that. Obviously that you don't know the pressure that you're applying. Right. So I, would, I wouldn't use that for clinical settings or anything like that. So yeah, I am in agreement that there are certain cuffs that have a lot of great features. Um, I think the Delphi uh, is one of them, but I, I think that there are probably many good systems Um that you could probably use as long as you are able to apply a relative pressure, especially in the clinical world. So you guys, you guys have done a ton of work. Well, I should say Jeremy's done a lot of work and you guys formulated this, uh, this team and you guys put together this paper. Let me just read the, the title of this paper, which is ultimately what got us interested in wanting to talk to you guys. And this, this paper was published in, uh, April of 2021, and it's Acute Exercise in Cognition, a review with testable questions for future research into cognitive enhancement with blood flow restriction. And that is, of all the, all the blood flow restriction classes I've attended, there's always a giant question mark about what, what do the clinical considerations for cognitive uh, decline, cognitive development, um, that, that blood flow restriction might have. And there's always been a, we don't know. Um, and so I'm fascinated by this, especially for our, um, our you know, elderly population. Could we possibly see some benefits with cognitive decline? Or is this something that there's a certain population? So I think I'll direct this question to Emily with the cognitive um, considerations in that paper. What were some things that you, what, what were some things that you wanted to achieve by publishing that paper? Um, well, the first thing that I was really interested in was, was supporting Yuji. Um, this was kind of like his 
his area that he was really interested in and he's done his master's thesis um, on on things related to that and so I really wanted to support him um, but I have a lot of experience in in the cognitive realm not so much with blood flow restriction um, but I was also interested too you know are there ways that blood flow restriction can be beneficial from a cognitive standpoint are there you know what issues or challenges might we face in this context? Um, and so that was kind of, of where I was coming from. Um, as far as, you know, the elderly population and this being beneficial over like longer periods of time, um, I think that's a question that's presently unclear. So that's, you know, why we were looking at, you know, testable questions for research, because studies would have to be very carefully designed and be training studies operate over longer time courses to be able to really provide, um, you know, credibility to those outcomes. But I think it's, they, they, these are questions that are worth answering. Right, so do you think that this paper was a step in the right direction to maybe provide some some hope that there might be, that this this treatment or I, this, this, this strategy could be of use down the road and we might have the data to back it up? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have, you know, the fundamental puzzle pieces to to create hypotheses that can be tested. Um, you know, our conclusions were that that there's really no reason to to expect that this wouldn't be a fruitful line of research to pursue. Right. Um, so that was really, you know, encouraging for us. Awesome, awesome. And Jeremy, your role in that paper. Um, were you brought in as the BFR guy to try to try just explain BFR, or, or what was your what was your role within the paper? So, as Emily said, Yuji uh, Yamada is the yeah. lead author. He's uh, uh, one of my students. So that the whole kind of idea from we were at ACSM, um, I don't know, maybe three years ago at this point, and three or four years ago, I can't remember. Um, and George Brooks was presenting some data. Um, and, you know, he's done a lot of stuff with lactate and, you know, he's recently come out with some stuff. His, his I think maybe his postdoc Hashimoto came out with some stuff suggesting that lactate is a preferred fuel source of the brain, especially after exercise. And they showed some things that, that it, it could improve cognition and specifically uh, inhibitory function. Um, so as I was sitting there, I was kind of thinking, I'm like, man, we could probably, I mean, one of the things that blood flow restriction does is augment the ability to produce lactate. Um, so I, I wonder if we could do something here. There's not, there wasn't a lot of data. There's been one paper come out since then. Uh, we've come out with a couple, but not what I would call like traditional exercise, more of hand grip, but uh, there was a walking protocol that did show that blood flow restriction was able to improve executive function. So inhibitory control. Uh, so that's where it kind of started and then we, kind of did some work uh, trying to get some funding um, for UG's thesis, which we were able to get. Um, and then when we were kind of going through it, it's like, well, we should probably, there's not a lot on this area. We should try and write a paper about this and, and kind of put all these thoughts in, um, in, in kind of one place. And I think the, the key point is, is that to try and provide some sort of direction. So we have actual questions. So not just going, Hey, this might work. Uh, more research is needed. So that, I mean, that's kind of we did say that, but it's also like here are some things that you could specifically do, and here's some things that you could think about. Um, so when we were doing that, and 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 she's right, Yuji got kind of really interested in this, and you know, as a as a mentor, when you're working with people uh, with the blood flow restriction, I have a, I have a very good idea of. Uh, of whether or not something makes sense or might be true. Um, with muscle, uh, muscle growth, very similar story. Not always, but generally. Uh, muscle strength, very similar. Um, when Yuji's sending me some stuff with the cognitive function, um, that's when I, I was quite uncertain, honestly. And so what, what and it was, you know, I, I, in the middle of this paper, we started getting into COVID. So it was, it was a lot of kind of things where it's like, you know, we really, if we're going to publish this, we need to make sure that what we're saying is actually true and that we're not missing some sort of bigger kind of thing here, something that's obvious um, or something that's not as obvious. So, you know, he, he might, well, he might, might write like two or three paragraphs, but it's like, 
I, it makes sense to me, but I don't know if it's correct. So um, that's where we brought Emily on board uh, with our kind of group and said, hey, can, you know, do you have any interest? Um, thankfully, she did. Otherwise, you know, the paper would have just stopped, honestly. <laughs> like, we can't, we we're not going to be able to write this paper without somebody who, who kind of knows that area. So I think if we were able to form a, a pretty good team uh, to try and uh, to, to write that paper to, to facilitate future ideas to test. Brilliant. Very, very cool. And I love how you kind of recognized your limitation and then reached out and phoned a friend, uh, someone with that, uh, that area of expertise, because that's something that, again, from the clinical perspective, if I can't help someone, I actually feel like it's my responsibility to get a patient into the office of the appropriate provider so that they can get that, that care or that, um, you know, that outcome somewhere else. So kudos to you for recognizing that there's someone else out there that, that can, help, can help the cause. Well, it, it, was, it was pretty obvious initially, too, because I was like, you know, Emily, we're, what we're interested in is whether or not blood flow restriction can improve cognition. And it's been, she's like, well, that's quite a term. Like, there's a lot of things that encompass uh, cognition. And then uh, I start to realize that, oh, cognition is kind of this overarching thing that is then made up of multiple components of then multiple components of then multiple components of then, which you have certain tests that test one component, but not another component. So I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> UG, we're, we need to do some one more reading, but two, we need to, we need to make sure that we're running everything by uh, Emily. So, well, that, I, that's a great segue into my next question to Emily, which is, um, what is cognition? <laughs> um, I think it's kind of an umbrella term for all of the, the mental faculties that one might have, you know, there's executive function, which in and of itself is also an umbrella term, like it's, it's inhibitory control. So, um, you know, uh, working memory, and it's also, uh, you know, a variety of other aspects that, that play into, into these uh, larger, like, I guess, macro cognitive functions. So when you ask questions like, does exercise improve cognitive function? Well, what cognitive function are you primarily interested in studying? That's a great point. You know, so uh, another, you know, like planning, you might study planning, and that's an aspect of executive function, but then that leads you down to, okay, well, what, can, what you know method should we use to assess planning? And there are so many different tasks that can be used. And one of the, the larger issues in, in designing these studies is that many of these like micro cognitive functions aren't task pure. So you might be assessing planning, but you're also assessing aspects of working memory. You're also assessing you know, other types of things because these, these things aren't easy, easily separated. Yeah. They rely on a, a lot of different cognitive functions too. So you can say with, with pretty good confidence, we, we think we are assessing this cognitive function to a large extent, but that's not to say that it doesn't involve other aspects of cognition as well. Oh, that's a really good point because it's, it's really challenging to isolate certain areas of the brain and, in, and then focus on that without affecting other key important areas. So I really like the way you put that. That was good. What, um, what can us in the, uh, in the trenches, so to speak, what can we learn from this paper uh, on cognition in clinical practice for those who maybe, um, maybe they're like me that help 14 to 40 year olds that are involved in some type of athletic event and maybe sustain some type of concussion or head trauma. Um, and, and if you don't have an answer, that's okay. But I just wanted to pick your brain and say, what's something that we can take away that can help our younger population? And what's maybe something that we can take away to help our older population? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not sure that I have like a specific answer for like the thing that could be used to help. Maybe Jeremy has um, something to add there. Um, you know, we're, we're in such an early phase phase of, of having these questions, but not having a ton of research to support it. So I'd hate to just, you know, give a recommendation or a consideration. Oh, that's, that's, that, that's completely fine. Even if it's just, there's a glimmer of hope that there's, there's, <laughs> there's a possibility that, you know, I guess I, what I was trying to do, if I can lead the witness here for a second, is I was trying to connect the dots between like, okay, rather than just resting, which I, I despise as a, although with bone stress injuries, okay, that's a, that's a so, total separate thing. 
I despise just this, well, rest, set, set aside, just don't, don't do anything. And I'm, I, I get agitated and I'm very passionate about doing something else. So if we have someone who is concussed or has sustained a head trauma, could it be beneficial to just put a tourniquet on their arm for five to 15 minutes? Could it be beneficial to put a tourniquet on their leg? They don't have to exercise, but is there some type of change that might be happening cognitively just, just by putting a, a tourniquet on. And I hope the answer is maybe we can show it down the road that, yeah, it's beneficial. Um, so that's, that was kind of what I was getting at. And if there's no, if you don't know, or if it's not out there yet, that's fine. I'm just trying to, trying to connect the dots here. Yeah. yeah I, I think, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I think the concussion one, I, I don't know. Um, I think the, and I think we've talked about this before is that, um, I'm, I'm not a clinician, um, I'm an academic um, researcher. So, you know, my role is always, you know, this is what we find in people who are overtly healthy. Um, and kind of my message to clinicians always is, is take what I say based on what we do with overtly healthy individuals and then mold that with their clinical experience. I will say that, you know, we are, as Emily said, we're in the early stages of studying blood flow restriction. Um, we had to transition to another type of exercise, which was like hand grip exercise during the pandemic, just so we keep trying to answer questions that we were interested in. We actually did not find an improvement in interference control with that. However, uh, we've since done some aerobic type exercise uh, with and without blood flow restriction, and we actually did find um, an, an, an effect uh, on interference control. So. I, I, I think the, um, I think that it's hard to say that that was the blood flow restriction by itself. You know, one of the things that we were interested in Yuji's uh, thesis was, was looking at kind of differing modalities, but also trying to tie in that lactate piece uh, with the change in inhibitory control. So what we can say from his thesis right now is, and we're still kind of going through it, is that there, there was at least a short-term improvement in interference control uh, relative to a non-exercise control. So, I mean, it's at least a treatment effect. Um, you can start to argue and go, well, how big is the effect? I don't know. It, it's measurable, um, which I think is step one, uh, meaning that it exceeds error. Uh, so the random noise. So it's, it's, it's better than doing nothing. I don't have anything that would that would wonder there. Um, now, the, the part about lactate and Hashimoto suggested that lactate could be a brain fuel and that that might explain some of this. Um, we weren't able to find evidence that a change in lactate mediated any change in, in executive function um, using statistical mediation. Now, the caveats being, as we talked about earlier, it depends. The caveats being that we measured it at one time point uh, we didn't have cerebral uptake of lactate. Uh, we just had full, cold blood. Uh, we measured it, you know, again, like I said, one time point, and we have one measure of executive function. So there's a, to, to say that that disputes what George Brooks says, I, I think would be a major overstep. But I think what we can say is, because that's what we found, is that we have no evidence that, we found no evidence that it mediates it. But that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't. Um, so, yeah. I think our initial steps is when we use kind of aerobic exercise that has a cuff and when we saw aerobic exercise without a cuff, we were able to see um, some improvements uh, in executive function. So it's hard to say that's blood flow restriction by itself, but um, early stages so far, it seems to be okay. I mean, and th there's some data from Japan that did find with walking uh, relative to not walking that there was able to see uh, an improvement in interference control. And actually, now that my, my, my memory, Emily can explain how that happens, but my memory <laughs> just got stimulated that that paper from Japan, blood flow restriction by itself did not do it. Um, it, it had to be combined with exercise. So, yeah, I would say the available evidence right now suggests that blood flow restriction by itself probably doesn't do that, but maybe a small effect with exercise in that one domain of, of cogn cognition. Right, right. So where, um, 
And that, to me, that's, that's sufficient, right? I, I, as a clinician, just need to know that compared to nothing, you know, it's going to have an effect and hopefully a positive effect. Um, it, it does sound a little crazy to patients when you tell them, all right, we're going to be walking a treadmill with this on your leg. And they, if they've never had a tourniquet put on them, besides maybe just a standard blood pressure cuff where they're just sitting in a chair, you know, it, it, it's very rare that someone comes to our office and we put a tourniquet on them and we don't have to explain to them what's actually happening. Although it is getting more popular with college and professional athletes that are, that are more familiar with the, the cuff. Um, brilliant. Great stuff, guys. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll close up with this and we'll go with Jeremy and then we'll finish with Emily. Where Jeremy, where do you, like what, what projects are you working on right now? What papers are you working on right now? What's, what's getting you really excited about kind of your domain? Yeah, we've, I mean, we, we, we're still interested in a little bit of the cognition because we, we obviously proposed several testable questions. We've only addressed a small portion of that. So I, I think maybe moving in some, some of, the, of the other areas of those domains would be a, of interest. Um, I think looking at it um, with more traditional kind of exercise, meaning that um, not hand grip exercise, not necessarily the, the new step aerobic exercise, but more so uh, maybe leg extension, chest press, something like that um, is, is one of the things that we've been talking about recently of maybe looking at some, not only executive function, but maybe some indices of anxiety, maybe some of these other mental functioning. Uh, so we've proposed a couple of things related to that, um, have not had success with funding uh, to date related to that, but something that's of interest uh, because, you know, my focus is always on, on, on muscle and strength. That's always going to be a focus of our lab with blood flow restriction. But we also want to make sure if we can get the right pieces, like, like Emily, for example, um, let's start looking at some other areas that have not been as looked at uh, because lots of people looked at muscle size and strength. Uh, but what about this particular thing? So with blood flow restriction, this, it, there's an area that has, has been understudied, relatively speaking. So um, that's of interest. Um, you know, we have some data looking at what should come out soon, hopefully soon, probably in the next year, looking at the cross education effect and things related to that um, and what that might mean for some of the resistance training literature. Um, I don't want to say too much about that, but, you know, the other area that, um, you know, we've become extremely interested in that, that is controversial is, uh, you know, whether or not muscle growth contributes to changes in strength. So that's obviously something that we're quite uh, focused on as well. Um, and I just have found no evidence that in adults who lift weights, uh, that the muscle growth contributes to changes in strength. Um, so, you know, we've tried to study this. Uh, we've, we're unable to find um, muscle mass being a limiter. So in other words, how much muscle mass they gain limits how much strength they gain. We can't, we don't find it. So uh, that's a focus. Um, again, I think just to be clear, I think most people would disagree with that, um, which is okay with me. Um, but I, I think that, um, I, I think we just keep sit repeating things without actually having evidence for it. So, um, you know, again, my, my focus is, is muscle, uh, but, we are interested in addressing some of these other questions. Why, why do you think that is? Because common sense would say as my muscle size increases, my muscle size or my muscle strength should therefore also increase. And, yeah. but yet you're, you're, you're suggesting that a lot of people say that, and that might not actually be the case. Right. So I think the, I think the, I think the, the confusion is if we were to measure everybody, like at, at one time point, uh, people who are bigger tend to be stronger. Um, that's pretty evident. Um, and that, that's probably potentially due to differences in development, right? But when you take an adult and you have them lift weights, um, that's, that's potentially something completely different. Just because you have something that regulates something at baseline doesn't mean it regulates the response to exercise. So when we started to kind of think about this, um, I was actually, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious if you read any of my papers from 2008, 2009, up to like 2016, 
all of them are talking about muscle growth as a mechanism, all of them. Uh, but when you have students who aren't afraid to speak, students in your lab, meaning, um, who keep bringing up things like, hey, how come we keep seeing differences in growth? Um, but, or sorry, how can we keep seeing the same amount of growth but different amounts of strength? Um, and that by itself isn't necessarily meaning that muscle growth isn't a mechanism, that, that's not enough. But it at least sticks in your mind where you, they, they realize that, hey, there could be a disconnect here because you keep saying this, but we, our own data repeatedly shows something completely different. So we started to look back into the literature and say, okay, well, I, I love history. I, I love to know why people think the way that they think. Um, so we started going back through all the textbooks. We went back to um, some of those early papers that are often cited. And we started to read those and go, you know what? <laughs> you can't actually make any of the claims that they make based on any of this data. So we started to design um, studies to try and address this. And again, uh, we have one group that increases muscle size and strength, another group that doesn't increase muscle size, see the same change, see, sees the same change in strength. Um, you know, and those study designs have their own set of limitations, uh, which we've addressed as well. And we just are unable to find it. So one of the things that, that, that I, I, that I, I like to say is, is that I wonder if, if we would have um, just gone back in time, right? And let's just pretend like nobody ever said muscle growth is a mechanism of strength. And then you, Alex, had to go find evidence to say, no, 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 it is a mechanism. I don't think any of the stuff that you would find would convince anyone. It's just the fact that we've said it repeatedly. Um, and it got repeated several times in many, many textbooks over the years. Uh, but they all cite usually the same two studies or three papers. One of them is a, uh, a review paper by Digby Sale. Um, and two of the papers that are discussed is the Kai uh, and Fukunaga and then Mortai and DeVries, which Mortai and DeVries, they didn't even measure muscle growth, which I find fascinating. Um, and they were completed on five people, five. We've done this on 150 people. Uh, repeatedly. Um, and, and so it would be premature for me to stay here and go, I know for a fact that muscle growth doesn't contribute to changes in strength. I don't know that for a fact. What I do know is that there is no experimental evidence that shows that that's the case, right? That muscle growth is a mechanism. It doesn't exist. Um, so um, we have a lot of work to do, but I, I think that, you know, if, if you have listeners who are going, well, what does that mean for me? I think what I always say to coaches or clinicians is if you, Alex or whoever, if you think that muscle growth is a mechanism and you're programming an exercise program for strength, then it would be pretty silly to not do something that you think is valuable. But, but I think what you could take is, is that, look, the experimental evidence is non-existent. So maybe what that means is, is that I can put less of a focus on it. So Whereas normally I, I put a lot of more exercise, more, much more volume to get that growth and an effort to increase strength. Maybe I can cut that back because if it is playing a role, maybe it's very, very small. And I think the, the last point, and then I'll, I'll step off the, off the, the um, can't even, I can't even think. Um, but I think the, some people have brought up, if it, if it was such a powerful mechanism, then how come it's so difficult to provide evidence for it? You would think that it was everywhere. Um, and- Fair question. What, what I find is, is that most people don't understand what I'm saying, is that they think that what I'm saying is, is that muscle growth isn't related to strength, or, or sorry, muscle size isn't related to strength. It most certainly is. I'm talking about the change with exercise. Because sometimes I'll get into a discussion and people go, so you mean to tell me like, Jeremy, there's lots of things that, that, that influence strength, like your lever arm. It's like, yeah, but your lever arm doesn't change with exercise. So all I'm interested in is what happens after exercise, that's it. Um, and that's, that's what I'm talking about. So I, I don't know, the next question is, well then what does contribute to strength? Uh, I'm not sure, but, but I, I think the fact that we know that specificity is a huge component it would probably make sense to focus on something that might be able to explain that specificity component. 
Uh, but it, but again, and just to be clear, it is it, it is premature to say muscle growth is not a mechanism. Right. But, but what you can say is that there is no experimental evidence that it is. Brilliant. Well, as as new research and as new papers you know are brought to the forefront here, let us know because we would love to have you hop back on and and have another episode where we can expand even further on that. Um, yeah, that, that would be a fantastic future episode for sure. So keep keep us uh, in the loop on, on what you find, okay? Even if it's, hey, I, I was wrong or there, we need more data or we're, we're still not sure. We still want to have you come back on. That I think that would be a great future episode. Um, Emily, let's let's switch over to you real quick. Um, in your in your cur- current role, uh, as you mentioned, as a consultant, right? Um, is, was that kind of, I meant to ask you this earlier, was that a tough transition to go from academia into consulting? Yeah, yeah, it's very different. Um, tough, I don't know. I mean, any new job is tough, but I've enjoyed it so much so far. Um, it, I like, you know, new experiences. Education has afforded me, you know, the opportunities to pursue a ton of different things. Um, and so this is just another exciting opportunity. And in a lot of ways, it's it's very challenging because, um, you know, the deadlines are just so tight. Whereas in, in academia, you also have tight deadlines, but you are answering research questions and analyzing all the data that you have in a very meticulous way. And we still operate under high scientific rigor, but sometimes our clients are like, we don't want you to analyze all the data that you have. We want you to analyze this one portion. And so we're like, but there's so much we could do. Um, you know, so so it's a little bit of that, of being like, okay, like we have been hired to answer this one question and we'll focus on that. Um, so yeah, in, in that respect, it's been a little bit of a transition, but I've really enjoyed it so far. So do you, for this consulting role, it, it, based on what you had just said there a minute ago, you analyze the data. Is it from a specific group? Is it from individuals that con- contact you and, and contract you? Like what, explain, elaborate a little bit on your role. Yeah, it's it's exciting. We do a lot of different projects with a lot of different clients. Um, I work under a supervisor who kind of um, goes out and, and gets a lot of business with his connections that he has. And then we also, you know, attempt to, to get our own business as well. So it's very collaborative. Um, but I've worked on some interesting projects that I feel are related to the work that I've done with exercise and um, creativity as well. So on the exercise side, I've, I'm really interested in wearable devices. Um, so I've been doing some work with colleagues um, in Phoenix looking at, at wearables and heart rate um, and different uh, demographic groups and how active is the heart rate response within these demographic groups at uh, various levels of exercise intensity. And so that's really interesting as, um, you know, the client is developing their algorithms to be accurate and precise over different time courses. Um, You know, we've also looked at using augmented reality in retail environment settings. So comparing this to kind of a gold standard of how employees do their job um, to this new augmented reality and related to creativity, we know that, you know, when people become very entrenched in a certain way of doing things, you develop a habit. Sometimes it's quite hard to shift cognitive perspectives and and learn something new and kind of be receptive to something new. So one interesting thing that we found was that although there was a lot of technological challenges in this new proof of concept augmented reality device, newer associates were picking it up a lot easier because they hadn't yet developed that that habit of picking of, of fulfilling their orders with you know the previous gold standard um, so that was really interesting too kind of like the malleability of of a new associate compared to you know people who have been doing it forever so I, I just think that the the work that we do it um, I love how it uses my kinesiology experience as well as my you know cognitive psychology training too that's incredible that's really fascinating um... Yeah, just all around like that. That just I'm sitting here thinking, my goodness, I would have never thought that that would be happening. Um, but at the same time, how awesome that that there are different developments. And so really, really interesting stuff. So where where do you see kind of, you know, your consulting role and just the things that you guys is it really whatever comes across your plate? You're just going to race after or like where, where do you see your your uh, your next couple of weeks and months and years headed? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, now is my role, you know, I'm a junior scientist now since I've just transitioned from academia to consulting. So I am doing a lot of different projects. The goal is to be able to do all kinds of different projects so that as I develop in my career, I can kind of develop an area that's uniquely my own. And I would love to continue working in the wearable space and doing user experience studies because I still really enjoy research. And one of the fascinating things to me is to be able to ask people about their experiences with new things, um, because I feel like that relies a ton on, on creativity, and you know the cognitive response is the stimulus sufficient to el to elicit an effect, whatever that effect may be. What is the time course? So, you know that's really where I see my career going. And we have a lot of different consultants within the firm who have experience in that area. So, um, you know it's it's only growing, and it's nice to be able to have those connections and have uh, the support of colleagues who who have that experience already that I can collaborate with. So. Really? So yeah, that's that's where I see it going, and um, you know that's not to say that I won't develop other interests along the way, though. Well, I'm going to take my clinician hat off and put my my parent hat on real quick, <laughs> um, because I, I we, my wife and I have four kids, and they have different you know go figure different different levels of creativity. Uh, uh, our son is off in La La Land. I mean, all day long, uh, and he's and he has this creative uh, side to them that we don't want to suppress, but we also want doses of reality every once in a while. So what are some things that you've learned in your experience that um, foster or facilitate creative, uh, creative minds? And what are some things that uh, interfere with that creative, especially in the young, I mean, our son is eight. So what are some things that we could do as parents that can facilitate or, or at least not, uh, not interfere with his creativity? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, whenever I was doing my uh, PhD in cognitive psychology, I worked with a developmental psychologist. So my mentor, um, her background was in developmental psychology. So we did um, a little bit in, in child populations. And I think one of the interesting things about creativity is that a lot of people think that it's kind of relegated to art or it's relegated to like these very specific little buckets. And it's not. It's it can be applied across a wide range of different tasks. And so I think one thing that parents can do to encourage it is to ask like open-ended questions. Like if your kid says something like, you know, that cloud looks like a butterfly, like, why do you think it looks that way? Can you tell me more? Um, so like, you know, really asking your kids to elaborate or, you know, you just present them with a pen and say, what are all the different ways that you could use this pen? You know, normally you use it for writing, but let's pretend it's a wand, you know, just things that, that ask your children to think about the world in new and exciting ways. I think that that encourages that cognitive flexibility and, you know, to be, I guess, to put it in simplistic terms, like thinking outside of the box, you know, maybe the box doesn't exist at all. Like what else could it be? So just kind of like being playful and and encouraging your kids to not think about things in kind of this linear way, but to explore all kinds of different opportunities. Awesome, awesome. I, I learned a lot about that uh, from my wife, the way that my wife uh, asks those open-ended questions as well. Is, it's definitely, um, you know, she does that quite well, uh, I have to say. I'm a little humble brag on my wife right there. But, um, but yeah, I think that we could learn a lot from kids. Uh, at, you know, us adults can learn uh, how kids view th view things and and they just they they view the world very differently and um, it, it's it's truly special so um, I think that's a great place to uh, to call it um, thank you guys so much for coming on Emily you have any closing comments questions concerns <laughs> no I just think that one of the most interesting things maybe for clinicians when you're thinking about you know does this stimulus of blood flow restriction you know plus exercise uh does that elicit a cognitive response like just think about you know how long would this cognitive response be expected to last you know one of the things about acute exercise is that the response usually has to be measured in very close proximity to the exercise. Like, you know, our kind of rule of thumb in our lab was like within five minutes, you want to yeah. assess the cognitive response. So, you know, just keeping in mind that these, these acute changes might decay very rapidly. 
But, you know, over time, as you adapt, then you might see more longstanding. And that's not to say that, you know, you absolutely will, because, of course, it does depend. But just thinking about those things and how they might apply to to patients or, you know, where research might go in this area, I think is is um, useful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad you finished up with that because that was in the back of my mind as well. So thank you. Uh, Jeremy, any closing comments uh, or, or concerns? No, I think just to echo what Emily said, if if you're using blood flow restriction or, or some form of exercise, and let's just say that low load exercise or low intensity exercise with blood flow restriction, let's just say it doesn't have a long lasting effect on cognition. You're still getting other benefits of exercise. So one of the things that is pretty clear is, is that when you apply blood flow restriction to low load or low intensity exercise, there is a treatment effect with muscle, uh, meaning that it does produce more muscle mass, more strength than the same exercise without blood flow restriction. So if you also get a cognitive benefit from that, that's tremendous. Um, but even if you don't, you're still getting some of the benefits that you would get from exercise. Um, and I think that's important to, to note um, because movement if, if you are hurt um, and you can't move, that's not that, that's a recipe for losing muscle mass or losing function that you, if you're young, you might regain. Uh, but if you're not young, you might regain some of it, but not all of it. So you're getting in. And I know English and Patton Jones had this uh, catabolic crisis model where they would suggest that once you get past a certain age, it's not a like a a. a, a, a a slow gradual loss of function or muscle mass. It's a plummet that you regain some, but not all of it. So I think whatever you can do to be active, and, and let's say that you have a, a patient who can do exercise, but doesn't want to do blood flow restriction. Well then, well then just do exercise, uh, do something you enjoy doing to stay active, because I think that's going to be important. And knowing that if it's of low intensity of low load, you might be able to get a little bit more if you were to apply blood flow restriction, but if it means that you're not going to do it if you if you because uh, you don't like it, then it's better to do something uh, to stay a little bit active. Um, and I think the outside of that, I, I think I you know the the paper today we you know we we brought them up, but I want to say it again. Like Yuji Yamada did a tremendous amount of work uh, for that manuscript. He's done a lot of background reading and a lot of background work on cognitive function. Um, you know, for his master's thesis, his, uh, another person in the lab, Rio Kataoka has done a, a lot of help for that. But I also want to thank Emily because w without her, it's like, I, I just, you know, it was just the confidence that I needed to go, okay, Hey, I, I think we're not interpreting this right. Or, Hey, we did a good job on this part. You know, Emily gave it the, the green light, you know, it, it just, it, when you get some Somebody who's in that area of literature it just it just helps. But I uh, also want to thank my other students because you know they're working all the time. They're great students. They always ask all these inquisitive questions. So um, I'm very lucky that I get to go talk about it, um, and people get to ask me questions about it. Um, but they do so much of, of the work. Um, so I'm indebted to my students, and, and specifically for this. Uh, paper, UG and then Emily. So we're, we're the big drivers of the, of the manuscript. Awesome. Well, I can't thank uh, you both enough. Um, you know, we, we put these podcasts out because we, we believe that our patients and our clients deserve our best. And uh, through your work, Jeremy, and through your work, Emily, um, we, we, first of all, we commend you on, on such impressive work and such critical work um, groundbreaking work. And, and both of you, like you came alive when you're discussing your, your papers. I mean, your face just lights up, you know, when you're talking, uh, you're passionate about what you do. Um, I, I speak on behalf of a lot of people. Thank you for what you guys have done, what you've published. Uh, thank you for your work that you continue to do. We're excited to see where you both go uh, in two different paths, right? You know, Emily with the consulting and Jeremy with the, the research and academia. Um, we, we will always have you guys back on for another episode to just hear what's going on in your life and in, in your worlds. Um, and again, thank you guys so much for all the work that you continue to do. Um, it's very, very needed. And I, I know I say this for a lot of people, thank you for your hard work and we really appreciate it because again, our patients are benefiting from your hard work. So uh, don't take it for granted. Uh, but again, we really appreciate all that you do. And I'm not blowing smoke. I'm, I'm being genuine here. 
thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for having us on. This was oh, really fun. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. That that is uh, that's a great place to wrap up. Jeremy and Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Alex.